Good morning and welcome to Holy Eucharist with Calvary Online Worshiping Community. Today is Sunday, October the 4th. It is the 18th Sunday after Pentecost and you are welcome and invited to come together with us here to worship God on this glorious fall day. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. We pray together. Almighty, Almighty God, God, to, to you, you all hearts are open, open all desires known, known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray and to give more than we either desire or deserve. Pour upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things of which our conscience is afraid and giving us those good things for which we are not worthy to ask except through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Exodus. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or is that in the water under the earth. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When all the people witnessed the thunder and lightning, the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, they were afraid and trembled and stood at a distance and said to Moses, You speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid, for God has come only to test you and to put the fear of him upon you so that you do not sin. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the people. Psalm 19 in your service bulletin will be read responsively by whole verse. And I will begin. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. One day tells its tale to another, and one night imparts knowledge to another. Although they have no words or language, and their voices are not heard, their sound has gone out into all lands, and their message to the ends of the world. In the deep has he set a pavilion for the sun. It comes forth like a bridegroom out of his chamber. It rejoices like a champion to run its course. It goes forth from the uttermost edge of the heavens and round, runs about to the end of it again. Nothing is hidden from its burning heat. The law of the Lord is perfect and revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the innocent. The statutes of the Lord are just and rejoice the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear and gives light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, more than much fine gold, sweeter far than honey, than honey in the comb. By them also is your servant enlightened, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can tell how often he offends? Cleanse me from my secret faults. Above all, keep your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not get dominion over me. 
Then shall I be whole and sound and innocent of a great offense. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Philippians. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as a loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the people. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his, his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him. But they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Today we welcome as our guest preacher the Reverend Susan Daughtry, who is the Missioner for Formation for the Episcopal Church of Minnesota. We thank Susan for her gift to us and her sermon today. In the name of God, the Creator, the Christ, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hi, I'm so grateful to get to offer this sermon to you and to worship with you. My name is Susan Daughtry. I serve as your Episcopal Church in Minnesota Missioner for Formation. My primary role in ECMN is with the School for Formation. It's a series of courses and workshops that anyone can take to grow as a leader in the church. 
I love preaching. I'm grateful to get to be able to offer this to you all today. I'm recording this sermon ahead of time on Thursday, October 1, 2020. So we just heard the story Jesus tells in the 21st chapter of Matthew, sometimes called the parable of the wicked tenants. This text is, uh, oy vey. If you are feeling a little confused by what you just heard, you are in good company. There's a lot of context in this story that does not easily convey to us in 21st century United States. So let's just unpack a little. And let's start by zooming out, way out. Jesus has been teaching and preaching in a rural part of Israel. There have been miracles. They fed 5,000 people who went out to hear him teach. The sick have been healed. His followers are increasing in number. And throughout this story, the people charged with tending the religious life of Israel have been offended because Jesus has been breaking the rules, challenging the norms. The conflict is building. Jesus finally tells his friends, we're going to take this to Jerusalem and they are going to kill me. So they start traveling toward the holy city of Jerusalem. It's the time of a huge religious feast, the Passover, in which many, many Hebrew people made a pilgrimage to the temple there. And when Jesus gets there, the confrontations with the religious authorities are becoming more intense. At one point, Jesus enters the temple and the chief priests and the elders approach him and say, by what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority? Jesus doesn't answer the question directly, but he tells them some stories. That was the portion of Matthew's gospel that you might have heard last Sunday, in which Jesus says to them, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness and you did not believe him, but the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him, and even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. That was last week. The text we heard this morning about the wicked tenants comes immediately after that. Jesus is standing in the temple, still speaking with the chief priests and the elders when he tells this story. And here's how this strange story goes. There was a landowner who set up a vineyard and then leased it to tenants and left. Apparently this was common practice. The tenants would farm it and give a huge portion of the harvest back to the owner. So the time comes for the owner to collect and he sends his slaves to receive what was owed. But instead of paying them, the tenants respond with unmitigated violence, beating them, stoning them, killing them. The landowner sends more slaves. The same thing happens. Finally, Jesus says the landowner sends his own son, thinking, they will respect my son. But when the tenants see the son coming, they say, this is the heir. Let's kill him and get his inheritance and the tenants murder the son as well. Then, according to the text, Jesus stops and he turns to the chief priests and the elders who are listening to this story. And Jesus looks at them and says, now, what do you think the landowner will do to those tenants? What do you think the landowner will do? They respond, the landowner will put those wretches to a miserable death and give the vineyard to other tenants who will behave according to the contract. That's an extraordinarily violent thing for the landowner to do, but maybe that is justice, given what the tenants had done. Maybe so. Jesus doesn't give a direct response to that either. He instead quotes the Psalms. He says, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. To our ears, this feels like a total non sequitur. What the heck is he talking about? It might be helpful to know that those words about the cornerstone are part of a text called the Hallel. It's portions of Psalms 113 through 118 that were recited aloud regularly at major holidays. Jesus isn't quoting some obscure and random passage to them. He's throwing scripture at them that they would have been about to recite at the Passover prayers. And then Jesus says, 
the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. There's a lot to unpack there. The story is hard to hear to our modern ears for a couple of reasons. One big one is the way slaves function in the story Jesus tells. In the political and economic context of first century Palestine, slavery was a common, familiar thing. The experience of powerlessness inherent in slavery was a key part of the story of the Hebrew people. And God regularly reminded them, I am the God who brought you out of slavery in Egypt. Slavery was a reality of life for many people and many households. And in this country, slavery is a part of our history that we have not reckoned with. We fought a civil war over the issue, but we have not, as a country, done the work of reconciling our national values with the historical and present day realities of systemic racism. The national reckoning that we're seeing right now around race is so crucial for us as people of faith to engage in, partly because texts like this one in Matthew have been used by people of Christian faith to justify slavery as being intended by God. And we have to engage in the national reckoning around racism, partly because this story can easily be read to take violence and murder toward enslaved people as just a fact of life, just a part of how society works. Those six or eight or 15 slaves that the landowner sent, yeah, they got killed. What were their names again? We could gloss over that to get to the point of the story. But if we do that, this story perpetuates our passive acceptance of the idea that the lives of people of lowest caste are not valuable, that those lives don't matter. We might be socialized to gloss over the slaves in the story, but Jesus is offering a mirror to his listeners in the Gospel of Matthew and to his listeners today, a mirror about violence. Did you notice, did you notice how quickly the chief priests and elders moved into the realm of an eye for an eye? Jesus says, what do you think the landowner will do to those tenants? Well, he'll obviously put them to a miserable death, they say. But stop and think about it for just a second. The story Jesus told doesn't give any evidence that the landowner is interested in violent retribution. By the time the landowner sends his son, the tenants have treated at least six slaves with unrepentant violence so that they can profit. If anything, what we know about the landowner is that he isn't resorting to violence against the human bodies of his tenants. What we know is that he keeps giving them more and more chances to change, making himself and his people vulnerable. And in response, the tenants only become more bent on theft and violence. I believe that in this text, we hear Jesus holding up a mirror to the powerful to show them their own violence. You know, over the centuries, many biblical scholars have pointed out that in this story, Jesus is referencing the history of the Hebrew prophets calling the powerful back to their faithfulness, faithfulness to God's vision of beloved community and meeting a reception of violence. That would have been quite apparent to the chief priests by the time this interaction was over. Many have pointed out, too, the connection between the murder of the landowner's son and the story of Jesus' death and the violent reception he got. I think it's fair to say that most mainline Christians have been socialized to read this story as Jesus getting to a punchline that indicts the Jewish religious authorities, one where the emphasis is on the gotcha. I like a good snappy comeback just as much as you do, but the mirror is being held up to us too. If we gloss over the violence in this story, the violence toward people who don't seem to matter in the text, what kind of violence are we willing to tolerate in our own lives in the name of God, in the name of law and order, in the name of the status quo? That's hard stuff. And it's particularly timely stuff, too, given what's going on in our world and in our country. 
the conversations we're having about race and white supremacy, about policing, about democracy, about the First and Second Amendments. This story is also hard for us to wrap our heads around because of the ways these kinds of texts have been twisted to support anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic violence. Whenever you hear the chief priests and the Pharisees in the Gospel, especially in the Gospel of Matthew, you have to remember that the Gospel is not conflating Jewish identity with those groups the chief priests and the Pharisees describes. The Gospel of Matthew, in fact, presumes that Jesus and most of his followers and everyone reading the story was Jewish. But Christians over the centuries have used texts like this to vilify people of Jewish heritage. Our tradition is responsible now for telling a better version of good news, friends. We are responsible for telling a better version of good news in which God does not tolerate putting people to a miserable and violent death because of their economic status, because of their ethnic or religious heritage, because of the color of their skin or their immigration status or their sexuality. This is where it really matters, friends, to be familiar with Jesus' teaching about the kingdom of God. Over and over again, Jesus in the Gospels teaches about the kingdom of God. And when he talks about the kingdom of God, he's drawing on images he learned from the Hebrew prophets. The image of the feast on a mountaintop, where the lion lays down with the lamb, where the weapons of war are recycled into farm tools. That's the prophet Isaiah that Jesus pulls on. Jesus learned that understanding of God's shalom, God's peace, from his own mother who sang about God casting the mighty down from their thrones and raising up the lowly. And in Jesus' teaching, he takes that image of a feast where power is bent toward care and concern for the powerless, where the mutual flourishing of all life is our collective concern, the wedding banquet with unlikely guests, the tax collectors and the prostitutes going into the kingdom of God ahead of the holiest priest. This kingdom of God that Jesus talks about isn't about a great balancing of the scales of history in the afterlife. This image that Jesus uses is about right now. It's about God's vision of the beloved community breaking into the structures and powers of this world. This teaching is what Fannie Lou Hamer and Martin Luther King and other leaders of the American Civil Rights Movement drew on in their teaching about beloved community. What society looks like when everyone counts when our policies and our practices and ways of living together assume that every human being is a beloved child of God. So here's what I hope you'll take from this sermon, sermon to chew on this week. First, I think in this text, Jesus is holding up a mirror to all of us. So we have to take a hard look in that mirror and ask, What's the violence that I have been willing to overlook? Whose death am I willing to tolerate as just a normal part of the story? And second, if there's good news in this text, I think it's what Jesus says about the fruits of the kingdom. Jesus says to the chief priests and the Pharisees, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom the fruits of the kingdom. What is that? What would the natural outgrowth of shalom peace look like? You might do some thinking about that this week. What did Jesus teach about the kingdom of God? What was it like? How do people treat each other there? What are the signs that you are experiencing a glimpse of the kingdom of God? What kind of things happen when people are seeking the kingdom of God together. I'd really encourage you to sit with that question. If that's where Jesus is leading, then that's where we are called to go as well. One really great answer to that question is in the vision that your new bishop, Craig Loya, outlined for the faith communities of the Episcopal Church in Minnesota last weekend in our virtual convention. Four priorities. Discipleship, faithful innovation, justice, and vitality. 
I'd really encourage you to check out his talk from last weekend. The fruits of the kingdom are the natural outgrowth of the Holy Spirit's work among us when we are tending God's vision of shalom. And God knows we need some of that shalom peace right now. Bless you, friends. Please join me and join others around our church and the world as we say together the Nicene Creed. We believe, we believe in, in one God, God the, the Father of the Almighty, Almighty maker, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Gracious God, you have planted your people in a fertile world and called us to be faithful stewards and fruitful servants. Hear us as we call upon you on behalf of all of your creatures, saying, the heavens declare your glory, O God, and the firmament shows your handiwork. Loving God, you have made us your own through Jesus Christ and given us a righteousness based on faith. Nourish your church that we may be people who produce the fruits of your kingdom. We pray for the Anglican Church of Tanzania and the Most Reverend Dr. Mambo Mandola, for Justin, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, the Presiding Bishop, and Craig, our Bishop for the Anglican Communion throughout the world, and for the faith community of the Church of the Redeemer in Cannon Falls. At Calvary, we give thanks for all who have helped with the care and maintenance of the lawn and oasis garden this summer and fall. The heavens declare your glory, O God. And the firmament shows your handiwork. Nurture our nation, that our confidence may not be in the flesh or in our own powers, but in the righteousness from God that is based on faith. The heavens declare your glory, O God. And the firmament shows your handiwork. Inspire all people to obey your commandments and pour the abundance of your mercy upon all who live in places of injustice and violence. The heavens declare your glory, O God. And the firmament shows your handiwork. May this community know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death and attaining the resurrection from the dead. The heavens declare your glory, O God. And the firmament shows your handiwork. Let the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, as we come to you offering intercession for those for whom we pray, especially Margaret, Renata, Donna, Ray, Peter, Jen, Mike, Paula, PJ, Carolyn, Maymay, Paul, and Jasmine, Bill, Sue, Jean, and Steve, Mike, David, Harry, Myra, Arnie, and Leigh, Tracy and Mike, Hope and Family, all those affected by the fires on the West Coast, for our President and First Lady and all who are experiencing the effects of COVID-19, and all who come to Rochester for hope and healing. 
Hear our song of thanksgiving and love as we pray to you with grateful hearts, especially for the baptism of Jack Montanari. Grant to all who have died to receive the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. The heavens declare your glory, O God. And the firmament shows your handiwork. We give thanks this morning for the gift of the flowers on our altar given by Jack Spatel in memory of his wife, Beverly. Watch over your people with providence and grace, compassionate God, and be our cornerstone to keep us safe, that we may join in the fruitful work of your son to bring forth justice and peace in a violent and divided world through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful, merciful God, God, we confess, confess that, that we have, have sinned against you in thought, thought word, and deed, by, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will, and, and walk, walk in your, your ways, ways to, to the, the glory, glory of, of your name. name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Once again, good morning and welcome to our online worship the service of Holy Eucharist. We're glad that you came aboard on this virtual way of worshiping. I wanna thank all who helped us over the past many weeks to do outside worship on Sunday mornings in our Oasis Garden. That came to an end last week as in Minnesota, we are now moving into true fall weather. It's kind of chilly now to be outside in, on a Sunday morning. Um, but we will be pre-recording our services as we are doing now putting them online at seven o'clock in the morning on Sunday. You're always welcome to worship throughout the week with us also. Today, October the 4th, we are observing this afternoon, St. Francis Day with the blessing of the animals at three o'clock. We will do this in two ways. You can come here in person. It's a little chilly, so wear your coat, hat, bring your animals, please come masked. We will be checking people, getting lists of people who come and we will just stand in the Oasis Garden um, and be with one another and we will bless our animals or you can attend by Zoom and you can find that Zoom link in the visitor that came to your inbox this past Thursday or you can look at our Calvary Facebook page today and find that Zoom link there as well. So we will bless our beloved animals in the courtyard but also on Zoom, so I hope you will attend whichever way feels right to you. Let us walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us in offering and sacrifice to God. Thank you. 
All things come of thee, O Lord, and of, and thine, of thine own, own have we given thee. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever say this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, 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 holy Lord, Lord, God of power and might, heaven, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ, Christ is, is risen. Christ, Christ will, will come, come again. again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit, to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our, our Father, Father, who art, who art in, in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. The gifts of God for the people of God. the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. Let us pray. Eternal, Eternal God, God, Heavenly, Heavenly Father, Father, 
you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. My friends, life is short and we do not have much time to gladden the hearts of those who travel with us. So be quick to love, make haste to be kind, and the blessing of God our Creator, Christ our Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit our Sustainer is with you now and will be with you always. Amen. Let us go forth in the world rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks, thanks be, be to, to God. God. And thanks be to you.